All right, so yesterday in lecture, we finished up talking about sp3 hybridized atoms. And let's go back and briefly take a look at this again. I said, in many cases, you have to hybridize orbitals in order to allow for electron pairing. And the first one we looked at was methane. We said if you draw the orbital diagram for carbon that's unhybridized, you've got the standard 2p orbitals. But if you look at those, you only have two unpaired electrons. You can't bond four hydrogens. So we have to hybridize the s orbital with all three of the p's in order to form an sp3 set of hybridized orbitals. Now you can bond four <coughs> electrons. And then we said it looks kind of like this weird balloon shape and it adopts the shape of a tetrahedron. And we said that anytime you have orbital head-on overlap, that that's called a sigma bond. So let's try a little bit harder examples today. Let's try C2H4. So what I want you guys to do first is to draw the Lewis dot structure of this and then check with your neighbor to make sure that it's correct. Give me a thumbs up if you think you got it. Send me some good thumbs. What's unique about C2H4? Has a double bond, right? So we've got a carbon, carbon, double bond. We've got four hydrogens. And let's take a look at just the right carbon. It doesn't really matter which one you look at because they're the same. All right, this carbon on the right, is it sp3, sp2, or sp hybridized? sp2. sp2. Why is it sp2? Yeah, steric number of three, three bonded atoms to that specific carbon, right? Doesn't have any lone pairs. So we know immediately that it's sp2 hybridized just by the Lewis dot structure. What's the approximate angle? about 120 degrees. And what's the geometry? Trigonal. Trigonal planar, exactly. So we're in good shape here. Now what we need to do is we need to again try to hybridize that carbon so that we can predict what orbitals are hybridized and which ones are left over. All right, so standard carbon. We've got a 1s orbital, we've got a 2s orbital, and we've got these 2p orbitals. How many total electrons? in unhybridized carbon? So periodic table number six. So assuming it's neutral carbon, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we need to do is hybridize this where we take one of the S's and two of the P's. So this one's unhybridized. We're going to go over here and we're going to hybridize it. All right, so now we've got this 1s orbital that's untouched. We've got a new set that's sp2. And that has to have three orbitals because we've hybridized three total orbitals. And then this 2p must be left over. And again, we still have six electrons, so I'm going to go one, two, three four, five, and then here's the tricky part. We don't start pairing right away. We actually will fill the p orbital. Does anybody know why that p orbital must have an electron? Yeah, you have to have it for that double bond, right? So it's kind of this weird exception to orbital filling. Normally, we fill those steps going upwards. But in this case, you'll fill that sp2 step and then put the additional electron in that p orbital to allow for that pi bond or double bond to take place. So does it need to be a higher energy um, to be a double bond? So the p orbital will be higher energy than sp2. So that electron is going to be higher energy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at this. We said that this is hybridized. And we said that it's got to be trigonal planar. So I'm going to try to lay this down flat on its side a little bit. So I'm going to do one carbon here. 
and I'm going to do another carbon right here. And we said that we've got these sp2 lobes that are going to be trigonal planar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw these in blue, like this. So that's one lobe overlapping with the lobe of that second carbon. I'm just going to write sp2, sp2. And then you've got another sp2 lobe kind of going back, so I'm going to do that as a dash. Another one going forward, so I'm going to try to shade that a little bit. And again, we've got sp2s, so three lobes coming off of each carbon. So let's mimic it on the other side. Uh, I'm going to make this bigger. And this is sp2, sp2. That makes sense because we know that there must be a sigma bond occurring between those two carbon atoms, right? So there's some overlap between the two carbons. Okay, now what I want to do is fill in the hydrogens. We've got some hydrogens over here. So I'm just going to label this hydrogen. And I'll label this hydrogen. And then over here, got a hydrogen. And over here, we've got a hydrogen. So that's all four of our hydrogens, right? What orbital does a hydrogen have? An s orbital. It's unhybridized. So it's going to pair up one electron from its s orbital with one electron from the sp2 orbital. And again, we're going to be forming more sigma bonds. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw in all these paired electrons. And I'm going to say all of these are sigma bonds. And sigma. Perfect. Are we done? Nope. No. So we've got to include that 2p orbital that was hybridized. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this p orbital. Let's pick a new color. Let's go with let's go with orange. I like orange. So we've got this p orbital kind of sticking straight up and down here, kind of like we saw in that problem of the day. And then this carbon also has a p orbital. And each of these has one electron. And they've got to be spin opposite in order for bonding to occur. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have a side on overlap. And what's this sort of overlap called? Pi bond. So another way of thinking about this is a double bond. is a sigma plus pi bond. And it's important to remember that pi bonds occur when p orbitals are aligned side on. So it doesn't work if you've got p orbitals that are actually perpendicular to one another. They have to be aligned, kind of parallel-like. Does that make sense? In order for the overlap to occur well. So this would be a good orbital drawing. I know this requires some artistic um, license. I don't grade on artistry, but I do want to see things labeled on quizzes and exams and things like that. So there's only one problem, but why is it on the top of the That's a good question. That's a really good question. So if you think about a p orbital, is the electron going to be in the top or is it going to be in the bottom? Cool. Yes. <laughs> right? So it can be in either place. That's the weird thing with electrons is because they're wave-like, they're occupying essentially both sides of that lobe. So the pi bond you can think of as being both top and bottom. It's kind of weird to think about it that way. All right. You guys ready for a harder one? All right. Let's see some more questions for you. That's fine. I just want to see that you understand that a pi bonds between two p orbitals. I've seen some students where they kind of draw them curving over the top and bottom. I'm fine with that too. Yep. Are you gonna like um, like give us like remind us to um, label label like on a quiz so that way we don't like 
Yeah, I'll try to be specific with instructions, but in general, when you're drawing these, try to label all your orbitals. So for example, label this P and label this P. That way, there's no confusion. As an instructor, when I'm grading, it gets pretty hard for me to tell an SP2 versus a P unless they're labeled well. So do me that favor. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at a harder one. Let's do the same thing. But let's do C2H2. So I want you to draw the Lewis dot structure and then predict the hybridization, geometry, angle, everything that we did for the previous example, but this time C2H2. Give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty comfortable with your Lewis structure. What's unique about it? Triple bond. So let's make sure we all get that. So carbon, carbon, triple bond. Does anybody know what this is called? It's acetylene. If you've ever done welding, you've probably used an oxyacetylene tank. This is the main carbon source for that. All right. What's the hybridization for that carbon? SP. SP. It's got a steric number of two. So this is SP. What's the angle? 180. And it's linear, right? That's an easy one. All right, so same sort of thing. Let's do our hybridization. So I'm going to do unhybridized over here just for redundancy's sake. <laughs> 1s, 2s. And then 2p, and I'll say this is unhybridized. And we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just like we saw in the previous example. But now what we need to do is hybridize it to be sp. So I want you guys to see if you can fill that out. When we do this, we're just going to take one of the s's and one of the p's. How many p orbitals are going to be left over again? Two. And again, we've got six electrons. So we go one, two, three, four. Should I go five, six? Why not? Yeah, p or fill or p or fills first. <laughs> fill your p's first, and then go back up and pair your sp's if need be. There we go. All right, so again, let's try to do a drawing. This one's going to be a little bit tricky, and I apologize if my drawings aren't as good. All right, so I'm going to do one carbon here, one carbon here. We've got an SP lobe coming off this carbon, going 180 degrees opposite of one another. Oh. Let's see. There we go. And then over here, same thing. Two p orbitals coming off of, or sorry, two sp orbitals coming off of each carbon. So I'll label these sp, 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 and sp. All right, we've got one electron in each orbital. So the carbon on the left, I'll say, all right, there's an electron here, electron here. It's overlapping with an electron from that right carbon. And then this carbon has one electron right there. All right. We're not quite done with the carbons, though. We've got those p orbitals left over. So let's go ahead and draw those. I'll do purple this time. Just like before, we'd have one going straight up and straight down. This is our p orbital. I'm going to draw one electron in here. Let's label this p. And we need to have it spin paired. So as you can see here, we've got a sigma bond right here. And then what would we call this overlap again? Pi bond. So I'm just going to label this pi. So 
so that we're being very thorough here. All right? But that's only one of the p orbitals off of each carbon, right? We've got to account for the second one. If the first p orbital sticking straight up and down, where should the other one go? In and out. That's where artistic license comes into play. So what we're going to do is we're going to do our best to show this p orbital kind of going backwards, so kind of behind here, and then sticking out like this. I'm just going to shade it really well. You guys kind of imagine my terrible drawing in three dimensions. So this, again, is going to be a p orbital just going in and out of the page. And we've got an electron sticking up and down. And now we've got pi bonds essentially going this way now. Move this p down. And then in the back, same sort of thing. All right, so we've got this really rigid system where we've got one set of p orbitals sticking up and down, the other one going in and out. And we've got two pi bonds in this case, so let's label our second pi bond. And I erase this here, but this is a sigma bond because it's direct head-on overlap. All right, so now we're missing the hydrogens. So we've got a hydrogen over here coming off the very end, so I'll do that as this s orbital. Spin this down, sigma bond right there. And then we've got a second hydrogen over here. Spin down. And this is a sigma bond. So I know these can be challenging to draw, but I really like people to visualize what's occurring at the molecular level, right? All right, now a thought experiment. If I took those two carbons, could I spin them easily? Why not? Yeah, the p orbitals are overlapping. They want to have spin paired electrons. If you twist those out of alignment, those aren't going to be happy electrons anymore, right? So double and triple bonds are hard to rotate. They're hard to spin. However, you can do it, but you've got to apply a lot of energy. Does anybody know how vision works? Vision is kind of unique. So vision is actually due to twisting of double bonds. So there are some photons of light that have the appropriate amount of energy to actually break a pi bond and allow it to spin. And that sends a signal to your brain that you're seeing red or blue. So it is kind of weird to think about. These are really rigid bonds, but you can break them if you apply enough energy. So something to think about. All right, does that make sense? So let's take another thought experiment into account. So let's compare sp3, sp2, and sp orbitals. Which one's going to be the longest? Why, why do you think sp3 will be the longest? Yeah, it's got 75% p character. So sp3 is longest since it has 75% p character. So that means it's more dumbbell-like than it is sphere-like, definitely. The shortest has got to be sp. And that's because it is 50% s-character, so it's 50% sphere-shaped. So it's going to be a lot shorter than those sp3 lobes. All right, so if we go back up and we look at our examples here, what's going to be a longer bond, the carbon-carbon bond here or the carbon-carbon bond there? Which one? The lower one or the upper one? 
let's think about it. So this is an SP2, SP2. SP2 is kind of in the middle. This is SP, SP. Those are shorter lobes that are overlapping. So a carbon-carbon triple bond is actually going to be shorter in length than a carbon-carbon double bond. And that's it. the reason behind that is the orbital hybridization that's occurring there. So a little bit weird to think about, but the more bond order you have, the shorter the bonds tend to be. Make sense? All right. Now we get to get into a little bit more Gen Chem review. This one's not as intense, I promise. How many of you guys remember the idea of polarity? Polarity is brought up again and again and again in chemistry because it's super duper important. So let's talk about the different types of polarity in molecules. There are three main types of bonds. I'll do one. This is ethane. C2H6. Do you think this is going to be polar or nonpolar? And I'll give you a hint. Carbon and hydrogen are about the same electronegativity. Nonpolar. So we would call this nonpolar covalent. This would be different than this example. In this case, we have methanol. Oxygen is very electronegative. So this would be called polar covalent. And then last but not least, we would have something like sodium chloride, where you've got a sodium cation that likes to be close to a chloride anion. And this is just referred to as ionic. There are some simple things you can do to determine the type of bond. The first is to go to an electronegativity table. You can find these in some general chemistry textbooks, and you can actually find a numerical value for an atom that tells you its electronegativity. As you can see, the more you get closer to that upper right-hand corner, the more electronegative you tend to get, with the exception of the noble gases. Those really aren't electronegative at all for the most part. All right, so let's go back to this. And typically, nonpolar covalent bonds are described as bonds where you've got two atoms, and the difference in electronegativity is less than 0 0.5. So let's go back and check with carbon and hydrogen and confirm what we were just saying. So carbon, if we look at this table, is 2.5. Hydrogen's 2.1. That's 0 0.4. That falls into nonpolar covalent. There is a slight dipole, but it's not enough to really be concerned about. It's, for the most part, relatively even. All right, polar covalents are a little bit different. They have a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.5 to 1.7. And I'm going to put approximately here. There are always exceptions in chemistry. I'm sure you guys are probably irritated with them at this point. But let's go check with oxygen and hydrogen. So oxygen's 3.5, hydrogen's 2.1, so we've got a difference of 1.4. That's a pretty polar bond right there, right? So polar covalent bond. And then ionic is basically anything that's more than 1.7. Some books will say greater than 2. The reality is there are some examples where there's a little bit of gray area, where it's not quite ionic, it's not quite covalent, it's kind of in between. So this is a really good trend that you can use if you're trying to determine the type of bond. So let's take a look at some relatively simple examples, and we'll practice Lewis dot structures again. Let's do... Let's draw CH2Cl2, and let's first do a Lewis drawing, 
And then we'll do a 3D drawing using dash and wedge. What's that? How much of the recordings do you just silence? I normally try to go in and edit them out. <laughs> um, I need to remember to do that, actually. All right, I've got a brain teaser for you guys. So this might be one Lewis dot structure that you'll see drawn versus one that looks more like this. Which one's correct? They're both the same thing, right? It doesn't really matter in this case. That's one thing I don't like about Lewis dot structures, is it can be really confusing. So, let's just make a note of this. These are the same. Let's draw a 3D dash wedge drawing now. So I've got carbon in the center. I'm going to put one chlorine up here. I'm going to put another chlorine down here. Include my lone pairs. I'll have one hydrogen that's a wedge, so sticking out towards us, and a second hydrogen that's sticking down here. All right, so now what we need to do is the, to determine the most electronegative atom and in this case, which one's the most electronegative atom? Chlorine. chlorine. So if we go up here, look at chlorine, it's 3.0. Carbon is 2.5. So it's not a huge net dipole. It's kind of borderline, but we'll call that a dipole. And so what I like to do when I show this is one of two things. I'll either draw in an arrow that looks like this, and then the tail of the arrow put a little cross sign on it. And then same thing over here. Essentially that little cross at the end of the table means that the carbon is more positive like because it's having its electrons pulled away from it. The arrowhead is showing where the electrons are being pulled to. So you need both the cross head at the tail and then the arrowhead showing the uh, pull of electrons. Okay, and then if we look at this Where's the net dipole going? Is it going straight up? Kind of in between the two? So a net dipole is where you treat individual dipoles like vectors. Has anybody covered vectors in physics? Yeah, so vectors says if you've got a force going this way and this way, the additive vector is in between the two. So dipoles are the same thing there. So in this case, this molecule has a net dipole that's being pulled in between those two chlorines. Another thing that I wanted to show you is we said that the head of the arrow shows where electrons are being pulled. This shows the atom having electrons pulled from. Some textbooks really like to show it with this arrow notation. However, other textbooks use different notation where they do delta positive and delta negative. Either one works. This one means electron poor. This one means electron rich. You can do either one, whichever one you're more comfortable with, I'm fine with. Does that make sense? All right, so now I've got some good ones for you guys. I want you guys to try to find a neighbor and work through these. And I want you to look at boron trifluoride, BF3, and NH3, ammonia. First thing I want you to do is to draw the Lewis structure and then do 3D 
And then I want you to, deter to determine the net dipole. I'm going to scoot this over. All right, let's reconvene and look at this. So BF3 has three fluorines around it. Are there any lone pairs left on boron? No, it only has three valence electrons, so no lone pairs are left over. What's the hybridization? SP2, exactly. It's got a steric number of three, so we'll say this is SP2. What's the overall geometry? Trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. And then what's the angle here? 120. Okay, if we look at the 3D structure, is it going to be any different? No, it's going to be flat in 2D. So I'll just write the same. Save us some time. All right, NH3. Now if we do the Lewis structure, we've got three hydrogens. Is that it? Lone pair where? On nitrogen. All right, so now if we look at this, what's the hybridization for nitrogen? SP3, it's got a steric number four. So SP3, what's the overall shape for nitrogen? Trigonal pyramidal. The easiest way to remember is it forms a little pyramid, right? So trigonal pyramidal. Okay, so now let's do the 3D drawing. We know that nitrogen's going to be center. We've got hydrogen here. One hydrogen's going to be a wedge kind of sticking out towards us. And the other hydrogen's going to be a dash sticking away from us. So it's kind of like a little tripod right now, right? The lone pair in this case is going to be occupying an sp2 lobe sticking straight up and down, right? Or sorry, SP3, excuse me. All right, so now let's take a look at each of these. And I want to focus primarily on the dipoles. I'm just going to redraw it so I don't clutter up the top drawing. All right, so boron trifluoride. What's the most electronegative atom? Fluorine, definitely. That's the king of all electronegative atoms. So it's going to pull electrons this way going to pull electrons this way. It's going to pull electrons this way. It's not a very happy looking boron, is it? All right. Does this have a net dipole? Why not? Yeah, they're pulling in equal and opposite directions, right? So it's kind of like having a tug of war where both people are equally strong. Nobody's going to win, right? So in this case, there's no net dipole because you're pulling in equal and opposite directions. <coughs> So the individual dipoles cancel. All right, now let's look at the ammonia one, NH3. In this case, what's the most electronegative atom, nitrogen or hydrogen? Nitrogen. nitrogen. So it's going to pull electron density away from each of these hydrogens. I'm going to show it this way. Is there a net dipole? Which direction is it going? Straight up, all right? So I'm just going to do this net dipole in green, sticking straight up towards that lone pair side. That means that the side containing the lone pair is really, really electron rich. So this does have a net dipole. That's why it's so important to know Vesper theory. You have to know the shape of the molecule in order to, de to determine whether or not they're canceling or if they're additive in some way, shape, or form. When you first look at these, you're like, well, they're really similar. They each have three atoms attached to a central atom, but they are radically different from one another due to their Vesper shape. Does that make sense? All right, 
I think we'll call it good for the day. If you want to stick around and start your pod, you're more than welcome to, though. <laughs>